details of CF lung disease. Take control. Okay. Uh, so here we try to describe the treatment um, of the uh, complication of CF lung disease and also how this will change our whole view of cystic fibrosis patient. Um, transplantation is not almost not anymore um, a theme in pediatrics. And also I'll talk about the new treatments um, of cystic fibrosis and what are the challenges of these treatments. So we talked about the first um, st stages of lung disease where you really try to eradicate the first bugs that you get. You try to hydrate um, your secretions with hypertonic saline, maybe DNAs. Um, Manitol is used quite uh, less frequently, is not licensed in uh, uh, many countries, and especially with physiotherapy where you try to get out your secretions. But if you have a little bit a more advanced lung disease after a period of um, hopefully only several years, then um, you will have the aim not to eradicate the bacterial anymore, but to reduce the bacterial load, um, to limit the inflammatory response, to treat exacerbations, and so to keep your lungs healthy. So how will you do uh, managing your chronic bacterial infections. We said if you have a first infection, try to er eradicate the bug. If you have the same bug coming in, you do the same treatment again. But if then the, the bacteria gets chronically um, infecting your airways, uh, which will happen, uh, happen quite uh, frequently, especially for Staphylococcus aureus, and then you will have to concern long-term therapy considered long-term therapy. And uh, for these uh, bacteria, you can do it with oral antibiotics. Sometimes you can cycle uh, antibiotics, for instance, one month on, on, one month off during the winter, for instance, or to change with two antibiotics so that you don't induce so many resistance if possible. It's the same for Pseudomonas erigionosa. If you have a chronic colonization, which is defined in, um, more than three months of repeti uh, six months of repetitive, at least three um, positive cultures of your, um, of your pseudomonas, then you will also give long-term uh, treatment, usually with inhaled antibiotics, tobramycin or cholestin are the usually first-line treatments. Um, Astronam lysine, for instance, is other one that you will also uh, give. give. If you have a pulmonary exacerbation, which is defined, it's, uh, there are several criteria to define it. The patient is feeling less well, is having more sputum, um, uh, maybe has low-grade fever, is not e eating well, and so on. Have a change of the color of the sputum, uh, but often it's defined just as the need to get antibiotics. Um, then you have to treat the exacerbations because exacerbations are associated with lung function decline. Here you have a study showing if you had one exacerbation, that's lung function decline, two during one year, it's more and three. So the more exacerbation you have, the more lung function decline you will have. So depending on the bacteria that you have, you can possibly treat your exacerbation with oral um, in antibiotics, but often you will then have to use intravenous antibiotics. The duration usually is two weeks, sometimes longer, no cl not clear if really you have a benefit of using longer ones. And if you have um, an exacerbation with a pseudomonas aeruginosa, you usually will use a combination of two antibiotics, um, third generation cephalosporin um, with the aminoglycosid uh, uh, combined. Tobramycin is preferred to gentamicin because um, it's less toxic. You can do sometimes home IV therapies, but then you have the drawback that you don't do physiotherapy supervised with your patients. And um, sometimes you find in your lab that uh, your pseudomonas, for instance, is resistant um, in vitro to some antibiotics, but they will still work if you give them in vivo in your patient. This is probably because you have a colonization of your lungs by different um, uh, strains of the same bacteria, and some of the strains will then still be uh, sensitive to the antibiotic you give. Some centers have been given 
have given routinely antibiotic uh, treatments IV every third uh, month, for instance. This has not been shown to be uh, statistically really of an advantage, although in this study it's been shown that there's some um, uh, likely advantage to do it like this, but there's a problem of toxicity, so uh, not many countries do this like this, but certainly important to try to treat quite early if the patient is doing less well with an IV uh, treatment. Because uh, of uh, your um, uh, bacterial infection of the lung, you will then have a neutrophilic response, and one of the main stem of the treatment is then to combat basically this excessive neutrophilic um, inflammation which uh, leads to the destruction of your airways. And the drug that is most widely used is azithromycin that you give it three days uh, per week as a long time treatment. Um, in the US, high-dose ibuprofen is used um, quite often, not so much in Europe because uh, you need to measure plasma level uh, of the drugs and to be in a good range, not too low, because if you give too low range, you have either, even a negative impact. So it's not used uh, very much in Europe. And steroids are not a treatment for cystic fibrosis. If a patient, of course, has asthma and cystic fibrosis, he will benefit from uh, steroids, but not for the cystic fibrosis. Important is how you will monitor your patients um, with cystic fibrosis. So um, you should see them at least every three months. And you do, should do regular microbiological assessment of the bugs that are infecting their airways. So the best is to do a sputum. You can try to induce it with hypertonic saline. And if you cannot do this because the child cannot produce a sputum, you can do a cough swab. Uh, lavage is reserved uh, to difficult cases. Um, for instance, if the child is doing just badly and you don't find any uh, bacteria on your cough swab, you cannot explain. So it's important then to do a lavage to see, for instance, do you have like a hidden pseudomonas in your lower airways? Lung function testing is the other one, um, uh, one important thing next, of course, to the clinical assessment uh, where you look at the weight gain of the child the microbiology is then the lung function that you do to um, assess objectively also the lung status of your patient. In patients with a normal spirometry, we certainly uh, use nowadays lung clearance index. And I think an important thing is to show the trend report um, of your values to the patient so he, you can show him how his lung function is doing and to help him adjust the treatment. The imaging is sort of a big topic of discussion. How often, when, and with what technique do you have to do your um, uh, assessments? Certainly once a year you need a, uh, imaging. The x-ray is not very sensitive to early changes. The chest scan has the problem of the radiation, and, uh, but there are protocols with low radiation. And if you have the availability of performing lung MRI, uh, that's certainly good, uh, but uh, uh, you need, in, depending on the protocol to have, you need also to have sedate the patient to do the exam. So this is about the uh, way to look at the microbiology of your airways. So the uh, lavage, of course, is the, is the technique that will uh, give you the best yield, but it's invasive. So it's, as I told you, you're just reserved for uh, special indications, um, but the sputum induction is a very good tool where you have a good yield of bacteria, and so it's better than a cough swab if you can do it. And uh, if uh, if you do a lavage once, then try to do it in all lobes because then you have the best yield of the bacteria uh, that you will find. So this uh, is I repeat what I said: show the lung function to your patient, and I show here one kind of tragical history of one of our patients uh, where you can show him what's happening in his, in his lung. So that was a 13 year old boy, Pseudomonas erythroma colonized, he had a decline of the lung function. So we started here azithromycin, very probably this should have been started much earlier, but it was not uh, wished by the family. 
Um, and then the patient got a bad viral infection, so his lung function dropped. We had uh, to hospitalize him for two weeks of IV antibiotics. And at this point here, the patient decided not to take any treatment anymore. The family decided that. They went to alternative um, med uh, doctors who did uh, strange uh, therapies and the lung function dropped uh, massively. The patient went to holiday in the summer and came back because he felt not well and agreed to take one month of oral antibiotics, but then uh, after holiday did not uh, resume his treatment. So it completely dropped with a lung function of uh, less than 30%. We started giving uh, hospitalizing with four weeks of IV antibiotics, then the lung function could increase again. And here there was some insight and the patient resumed uh, his conventional treatment and his lung function increased. I'll come back to that patient later. So um, adjusting your treatment with lung function is very important and also to have some criteria, how will you proceed? And this is a study that I really recommend that you read because uh, even if it's only, I said, published in Journal of Cystic Fibrosis, it's a very important one, where there was this, this was a center that had, uh, that was quite low in the lung function values compared to the uh, whole of America. And they started doing a, a quite severe program, but basically if the patient had a drop of lung function of a few percent, like more than 5%, they would intensify the treatment. And especially they would not see the patient just only in three months of time, but they would see the patient in six weeks of time. And with time doing this, they could improve the mean of their lung function at all ages of their patient. And I think this is, as I said, something that you should do so that you really can improve the health of the lung of your patients. I said about the monitoring of the lung function. Nowadays, children in Europe have almost all normal spirometry. Here you see the median of the spirometry values of adolescent children, and they are in the mean median over than 80%, which in Z-scores is probably in the normal range of Z-scores. So you cannot really see the changes uh, unless you have a severe case like I showed before by just looking at spirometry. And that's why you need more sensitive um, ways of looking at your lung function. And Monica Gap has explained this very well and showed this graph already where you see that um, the Z scores using with FEV1 do not discriminate so well CF children from controls. But if you have, you use the lung clearance index, you have a much better discrimination. And so you can have an early assessment of your dysfunction of the peripheral airways with this lung function test. And you should use this as a monitoring for early lung disease. I talked about the, the, um, uh, the airway uh, Imaging techniques, uh, upcoming techniques are long MRI techniques where you can see um, perfusions and ventilation um, deficiency um, uh, very nicely, even in new protocols without using any IV medication. This is not something you still in routine, it's more in clinical development. Here, uh, these nice pictures from a group of uh, the group of Philip Latzin in Bern. So then if uh, you still have a uh, problem that you have an advanced disease, lung disease, then you have complications occurring. I cannot explain all these complications that will occur in your lung in details, but these are the most frequent that you might, uh, you might find. Um, Hemoptysis is very late, uh, basically, uh, event. Uh, pneumothorax is a very bad prognosis, but I will just uh, talk a little bit about aspergillosis, bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, um, which affects um, up to 10% of the CF patients. And you will think of um, bronchopulmonary ABPA when your child has some wheeze or a drop in the lung function that you cannot really, really explain. And especially think of it if you have thick sputum with a black cast. So the diagnostic criteria for ABPA are listed here. Um, the most uh, common one that you will look at first is a very high levels of IgE as this allergic response to the um, aspergillosis that you have in your airways. How to treat the ABPA? The main stain of treatment is systemic steroids. There are different courses, how different protocols, how you can uh, use them. And very often you will add directly also antifungals 
like itraconazole or voriconazole to eradicate also to try to eradicate the, uh, the aspergillus. In children, we don't have almost, uh, in, now, nowadays, we don't have so much a problem of uh, having to transplant the lungs or children dying anymore, which is very, uh, very nice. Uh, if you look here uh, in 1988, so more than 20 years ago, um, people were dying with cystic fibrosis were dying at 50% uh, of the people were dying, so a median age of 22 years or so, and nowadays the curve here shows you that the median age death is 30 years, so it's not anymore in the children. Um, you will have to refer a patient to lung transplantation if you have a very bad lung function, usually something less than 30 percent, and in your children, in our children the retreat nowadays, these are really the challenges that we um, that we have to face um, problems of antibiotic allergy, resistance to antibiotics, new pathogens coming. If you want still to read about lung transplantation, this is a good um, uh, review uh, where you have all the criteria, indications, contraindications for lung transplantation. So in the last few minutes of uh, this talk, I will talk about the approaches to treat um, the basic defect, and these are the new, very exciting therapies that are coming. And that's why also it's important to know nowadays about your mutation classes, what's happening exactly in the cell. And the first trials that have been done is to kind of to read through the stop codons in this class one mutations and the medication that has been tried uh, most far in the, in the industry was the atalurin. And you see here one of the study of almost one year of treatment, which has failed to reach the end point of a good increase of FEV1. And so the company has uh, basically stopped the development of this product uh, to treat the class one mutations in CF. And the breakthrough has come a few years ago um, with the treatment of mutation class three, especially this G551D mutation, so-called gating mutation, where the protein is actually based correctly at the apical surface of your cells, but is not functioning. And the medication that um, has been uh, introduced or found uh, by the company Vertex uh, to do this through a throughout, uh, throughout uh, screening of many, many compounds and, and selecting those they uh, thought that could work is the Avacaftor, uh, which is the trade name is uh, Kaleideco. And you see here the fantastic effect of this drug. Um, uh, people who have starting taking the drug have a very quickly after they started uh, taking the drug an increase of the lung function of 10% um, of your percent predicted FEV1. Um, and over here, a period of three years, they could sustain this uh, fantastic improvement. Um, the drug has been then tested in younger and younger and younger children. And nowadays it's, um, uh, it's, it's uh, it's approved for treatment of children uh, even younger as two years of age um, for several uh, class mutations, class three to six mutations. The drawback of the treatment is that's a very, very expensive treatment of um, more than 2000 euros per year per patient, which makes it of course so that not all countries can afford such an expensive treatment. And then the big search has come to search for treatments to correct the, uh, the most common mutations that we have, this F508 deletion mutation, which is the most common, most prevalent mutation in the world. But here you have to do two things. You have to first of all correct here the protein that is misfolded. And when the protein reaches the surface, to potentiate it uh, so that the channels open. And first trials have been done, um, uh, or the first drug that has been licensed with this is the Orcambi, which is a combination of the drug we've talked about before, the Avacaftor with Lumacaftor with the corrector. And you see, and if you compare the graph of before where you had this fantastic increase of 10% FEV1, what happens with the Avacaftor um, and Lumacaftor with the Orcambi, where it's just an increase of two to 3%. And it seems that over time, 
after two years, you lose also some of the effect. You will not have a loss continuous of lung functions. You can just stabilize your lung function. But of course, it's less nice than the effect we have before. And the drug is also only working for homozygous patient uh, F508, who have two mutations, uh, f 508 so uh, a follow-up product has been uh, licensed in several countries, which is the Simdeco, which um, has instead of the Lumacaftor, the Tezacaftor as corrector protein, there's a better safety profile, but the effect is not much better than uh, this uh, first drug. And the big, big uh, breakthrough, I think, and it's very exciting, is the combination um, now of two correctors, uh, the Tezacaftor and the Elexacaftor, which has been chosen for further um, development of the product and the trade name of this um, medication is Trikafta. And you see here again in two studies a similar effect that what we have seen just with the Avacaftra for the class three mutations, where you have a nice increase of the lung function of about 10 or even more percent here, 13% in the uh, heterozygous patients. And so this will be a drug that is very uh, useful uh, for a lot of patients with a fantastic effect. Um, it's been approved in the USA uh, last October for children over 12 years. And uh, currently there are more than 10,000 patients in the US that are being treated with these uh, medications already. But you see at huge cost, so just for the treatment in the US, this is $3 billion per year. So hugely uh, expensive treatment and probably just available for a uh, few countries, but fantastic. And so I finish here by coming to back to our patient, uh, Arion, who is now 60 years old. And I showed you this, this uh, dramatic loss of lung function here and how he resumed his treatment and get to, got back to a better level. But here, uh, again, he lost uh, interest really in his treatment. He was very reluctant to treatment. He also developed diabetes and did not want to um, take uh, insulin. So we had to hospitalize him more often, more often for IV treatment, just to try to stabilize his lung function somewhere here, be beyond 30%. We had also a referral to lung transplantation last year um, to assess him if he would be suitable for lung transplantation. And then we were lucky to be able to start here, Trikafta in this patient um, as a corrector therapy uh, and uh, a corrector and potentiator therapy in an off-label program, uh, in an early access program and see how uh, the last lung function here a few weeks ago has dramatically increased again with this treatment, which is really fantastic news. So um, these are shortly the conclusions that I have. So we have to think LCI, no more FEV1. Uh, we have these problems of toxicity coming now of treating patients who have no problems clinically, but still having to do the treatments and these fantastic new drugs that are emerging. I go on to one or two MC questions. So the first question, you have a six-year-old boy with cystic fibrosis, who is clinical stable, but his lung function is worsening. We'll start him on an inflammatory, anti-inflammatory treatment. Which one will you choose? Okay, so uh, almost all have uh, answered what I uh, would like to leave. Really, oral prednisolone is something uh, that we will use just in as a rescue treatment in very, very bad patients, um, uh, just also to diminish the inflammatory response, but has a lot of side effects. And you will certainly not use it as a first line treatment in children. The second question, a 12-year-old boy with cystic fibrosis has a chronic pseudomonas aeruginosa infection. He presents with fatigue, worsening cough, weight loss, so he has a pulmonary exacerbation. What will you start doing in this patient? You will give him oral treatment with chromoxicillin for one month. 
You will give him cyprofloxacin for one month. You will admit him at hospital and give him two weeks of IV therapy with chromoxy and tropamycin, or two weeks with ceftazidim and gentamicin, or two weeks with ceftazidim and tropamycin. So that's also what we would do is give him two weeks of ceftazidim and tobramycin. You could give him, of course, also the gentamicin, but the tobramycin is less toxic. So if you have the possibility, give him the tobramycin. Um, oral treatment, in this case, uh, only if you don't have the possibility to give an IV treatment, but um, it will probably be less effective than really IV treatment in, in this age. And chromoxicillin certainly not because uh, it's uh, not effective against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And the third question, um, you suspect ABPA in a 13-year-old girl. Which of the findings that follow would not support your diagnosis of ABPA? Newly onset of wheeze, hemoptysis, sputum with black cast, a total serum Ig of 2,400 kilo units per liter, or a positive skin prick test to Aspergillus fumigatus. So which would not, which is the wrong one? That's correct. Hemoptysis is not a classical symptom of ABPA. Um, it's usually caused by erosion of your bronchial vessels, superficial vessels, if you have advanced uh, lung infection, but is not a sign of uh, ABPA. Good. Oh, I have the last one. I have a fourth one. So well, let's do this one. So which of these statements relating to mutation specific therapy is true. The G551D mutation is a frequent class two mutation. Ivacaftor calideco is a CFTR corrector for class three mutation. Ivacaftor lumacaftor, so the Orkambi reduces exacerbation in F500 del patients that are um, heterozygotes. Avacaftor, tezacaftor, so the same deco is beneficial in 508-del homozygotes, or avacaftor, tezacaftor, elaxacaftor, the ticafta, improves lung function in class 1 mutations. So this is correct. Um, uh, the Ivacaft of Tesla Simdeco is helpful in the homozygous F500 Dale, Dale patients, not in the heterozygous. Very good. Good. Alice, should okay. I take questions there, or go further? Yeah, there is a lot of questions, especially on antibiotics. Um, so we'll start with those. Um, IV, gentamicin, or amikacin, which is better? IV, gentamicin, or amikacin, uh, I don't know, probably both equal. Um, equal. Amikacin, probably. But uh, you can't say. It's equal. Okay. Uh, can one use the IV form of tobramicin if Toby is not available? Is that effective? Yes, that's what we have uh, used to do before. Uh, having uh, the tobramycin, the inhalation, the, the toby or the bramitrob, um, uh, we've had this. The only problem is that you have some compounds in the in the IV solution, um, preservatives that uh, make uh, can make uh, people cough more. Yeah. So you just have to test if the patient um, uh, tolerates it. But it's certainly as effective and it's uh, much cheaper, of course, than uh, the prepared inhaled solutions. Okay, uh, again on uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and antibiotic treatments, 
uh, if patient is, is if a patient is diagnosed with uh, one only positive culture for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and I guess for the first time, uh, uh, do you treat and how? Are you, you you will treat by oral cypro and inhaled trobora or and for how long? So yes, you will treat it even if it's just one um, uh, sputum sample because um, uh, the, this, you can see this in the ELIT study. Uh, no, it's, well, I don't know, I remember the name of the study, but it's a study that has been published in, in Journal of Cystic Fibrosis very shortly ago, two or three years ago, where you have seen that if you wait every kind of every day that you wait, um, before treating the pseudomonas it will decrease the likelihood that you can eradicate it. So really it's hit early and hard. And the favorite regimen in the guidelines um, is to use inhaled tobramycin for one month. There are some protocols, some people who use ciprofloxacin, I know this, there are some people who use combinations, but um, there are not many advantages of doing this. And the, the basic protocol that is recommended is one month of inhaled tobramycin. Okay, uh, for other uh, antibiotic treatments, you talk about uh, cyclic antibiotics for uh, Haemophilus influenzae, and also, um, uh, there was a question about uh, also cyclic antibiotics in patients with uh, Staphylococcus aureus. What do you think? Yes, uh, this is something that uh, we like to do in patients who do not so well uh, in and have a chronic colonization with Staphylococcus or with Haemophilus influenzae, that over the winter months, you will give them, for instance, one month of carmoxicillin, one month break, one month carmoxicillin, one month break, or for instance, one month of carmoxicillin, one month of uh, cotrimoxazole, one month break, one month, or just alternating. So there's not there are any fixed rules. There are no guidelines on this. There are no studies on this, uh, but it's clinically effective and uh, we use this. Okay, uh, another question, uh, but I think you have to refer to the sputum. What antibiotic is appropriate for empiric treatment in pulmonary exacerbation in CF? There is well, no depend <laughs> so, so what a lot of people do, if it's, uh, if you have just a C, um, uh, a hemophilus or a staphylococcus, you can use, for instance, cefuroxime or any antibiotic then alone also that, um, uh, that works against these, these bacteria. And uh, empiric treatment that we would use for Pseudomas aeruginosa, um, if it's no uh, staphylococcus, just a Pseudomonas, is cefalatidim uh, and uh, tobramycin. And if the patient has uh, Pseudomonas and staphylococcus, is uh, cefipim and, uh, and uh, tobramycin. Yes, but I think the message is, um, of, is especially to to look at the previous uh, results of the sputum yes. in the patient and to wait for the results. You, you can't treat just uh, like another usual infection in, in non-CF patient. You have to, to know what is the... Yes, you always have to know what your what bugs your patient carries um, on the long term. Also, to follow this and and to record to adjust your antibiotic treatment according to this. Yes. Okay, how long sh should you continue giving uh, azithromycin as anti-inflammatory? When you stop it, it's difficult. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> usually, you start it and you never stop it. But uh, uh, this is a uh, question that I think also that has not been addressed in studies really uh, when you have to stop it. Um, uh, well, you will stop it the day you start having uh, uh, non tuberculosis mycobacteria, for instance, because then you will give other treatments. Um, you will stop it, uh, pause it during um, exacerbations when you give uh, tobramycin inhaled. This is also a Difficult topic if you have the interactions between azithromycin and tobramycin. There are some conflicting results about this, uh, but usually it's a long term treatment that would, they would not stop. They would just give uh, lifelong. Uh, okay, there is a, a numerous questions, but I'll try to select some. Uh, how do you manage recurrent hemoptysis, persistent even after treating exacerbation, and if, when you consider embolization or a lobectomy? How would you know which lobe to do in case of a diffuse disease? Uh -huh. Hard question. Yes, um, well, so if you have um, a recurrent uh, 
hemoptysis, the procedure of choice is to do uh, the embolization, really. Um, with the bronchoscopy, you will not see a lot. And, uh, and uh, the, the best way, if you have the possibility to do um, interventionally with your catheter to look where the bleeding is and to do an interventional embolization of the, of the bleeding vessels, that's the procedure of choice. And um, uh, hopefully, you don't have to proceed to any lobectomy. That, that would be, uh, well, a very, very late stage. Where I've never seen that we had to do this. Okay, so I will go for one uh, other question, and it will be the last. Uh, why do you think the lung function gain after Ivacafta or Tricafta already occurs after two weeks? I don't think we have the answer. <laughs> it's a good question. I, I think really that uh, that. I mean, you correct, basically you correct the defect and your cilia can start beating uh, immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you see that we see that uh, in the sweat testing, you do the sweat test yeah. uh, one day after starting the treatment, the sweat test is normal. So in the same, in your, your, just your little hairs can start beating again and put the mucus out. And that's why you very, very quickly see uh, the improvement of lung function. I think this is, this is the mucus that you just get out and, and the, 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 the people who start on the treatment, they really have a few days after starting the treatment where they really, really cough a lot and they get huge amount of secretions out. So this is just the effect of your treatment. Yes. Okay, so let's move to extra pulmonary CF. Uh, you have 20 minutes and then we'll try to have some time for a few questions. Okay. So, um, well, this is a huge chapter also, all that happens. Um, uh, out of the lungs of CF, I said to the CF lung is the, the organ the most importantly damaged by, by, the, um, by the disease. But now with all the treatments, with the people getting longer and longer, you have a lot of other organs that you need to be aware of um, that can make complications. So Exocrine pancreas, of course, is the first thing that you will think of um, in a child, especially with cystic fibrosis, because uh, most patients have uh, an exocrine uh, pancreas insufficiency, so they cannot really uh, bring their own pancreatic enzymes into the, uh, into the digestive tract. And these leads, of course, first of all, to a weight gain problem and the deficiency of the fat-soluble vitamins. You will have to start them because of this on pancreas enzyme and that have to be taken for every meal, uh, for every fat that uh, is being given uh, through, the, uh, through the nutrition. And you have also to replace the uh, fat soluble vitamins. And then here's a big, big question mark if we really have to give a high calorie diet to these patients. I would say no. You have to give them a normal calorie diet nowadays uh, because they should be able to have a basically normal for lung function and don't give them this junk food here because if you do this and we've been used to do this for years, then um, they will have cardiovascular problems uh, later on. And uh, we know more and more of heart attacks, of, uh, of uh, uh, strokes in, in people with cystic fibrosis. This is an important uh, list that you can uh, keep for yourself. Uh, what what have you, do you have to think about if the child is not gaining wealth, weight correctly despite taking the, the enzymes? And just point to this point here. So the pellets that you give the, the crayon, uh, they are... Um, they are covered with some uh, layer uh, which protects them from acid. So they can pass through the um, stomach where they are not opened or not. And then they just have the effect in the duodenum and the small intestine where it's uh, alkalotic, which you have a high, where you have a pH that's high. So if you have the problem that you have an acidic duodenum, the pellets will just not uh, dissolve themselves. They will continue to go through the, uh, the duodenum and they will not be active. And so we will not be able to digest your fats there. Acute pancreatitis is a problem that you will find almost only in pancreatic sufficient patients, but it can occur. And so these patients have to know that this can be a complication. And on the other hand, if you have a 
otherwise healthy child with a pancreatitis, you have to think about cystic fibrosis. Other problems before birth, this is discovered, uh, described often the hyperchorogenic bowel. Um, it has not really a clinical uh, signification, but um, uh, it's some uh, finding that's often described. At birth, we have a part of the children who present with meconium ileus. It was a very bad prognosis 20 years ago, but nowadays it does not really change your outcome. And the rectal prolapse is something you will find sometimes in, uh, in children, especially if the pancreati pancreatic enzymes replacement therapy is not um, correctly taken. Gastroesophageal reflux is uh, frequent in cystic fibrosis patients. And um, you might think also of the acidity uh, of, the, of the duodenum, the stomach. Um, it can be a problem, especially in advanced disease, hyperinflation, um, increasing your reflux, and it might uh, be something you have to treat. And then a very uh, classical complication of cystic fibrosis, and this is one thing I say to the students always, you have to know this. I tell this to the parents, you have to know this complication because if you go somewhere on holiday to a small hospital where they don't know cystic fibrosis and the child presents with a lower stomach uh, pain in the abdomen, in the, uh, in the right lower uh, part of the abdomen, uh, pediatricians will think of um, of an appendicitis and they will send you to the send your child to the surgeon and he will operate and not find any appendicitis but just this uh, abdomen full uh, of stool so uh, think of this complication and if you have dos uh, well you have to um, kind of digest the stool that's compacted um, in the small intestine in the in the ileum um, and you you mainly mainly will use these polyethylene glycol um, solutions, uh, different products that you can, can use. Important also when you have disimpacted um, obstruction syndrome, then you have to do a chronic treatment for a few months because this can uh, reoccur. Cystic liver associated, cystic fibrosis associated liver disease. Um, this, uh, the fatty liver is a finding you will find very, very often on your ultrasound, but this is not really uh, something you have to worry about. Um, it's a common finding, which is not uh, really bad. The bad thing is when your child gets the cirrhosis, the multilobal barrier is cirrhosis, um, which occurs in some of the patients uh, who have some risk factors. Uh, you see here the pathophysiology uh, of this. Basically, what happens is because of the obstructed ducts in your liver, also, you have kind of noted digestion of your liver. Uh, and then, so uh, this is important to know also because usually it's asymptomatic. And the diagnosis that you will, you will make the diagnosis by finding elevated liver enzymes. And uh, you have, of course, to exclude other things like hepatitis and uh, to manage it. You will certainly give the patient um, biliary acids to try to improve that cycle of, uh, or to better, uh, you know, you have this reabsorption cycle of the bile in the blood and that goes again through the, um, through the liver. So you kind of rinse your liver and uh, you don't have this accumulation of bile acid that digests the liver. Uh, you have to immunize, immunize your children against hepatitis. You have to watch for development of um, uh, cancer, of a liver cancer and the first line treatment, because if you have a portal hypertension developing with viruses is doing like here illustrated on this picture, a ligature of your uh, viruses. The other large complication um, uh, on the the pancreas, as told before, of the exocrine pancreas insufficiency is the endocrine pancreas insufficiency. Uh, you have different uh, definitions of how it starts with impaired fasting glucose to impaired glucose tolerance to the finally to the 
uh, full-blown diabetes. And here the problem is that um, you have a uh, deficiency of insulin. It's not like in diabetes one, where you have like these autoantibodies that completely uh, destroy your beta cells in the pancreas um, and, and stop them from working from from one day to the other almost. Here it's more than your pancreas because it gets fibrous and, uh, uh, and destroyed on the long term. Uh, you have your beta cells that start working less and less and less and less. So you have kind of a basal insulin secretion that's here, but as soon as, as you give sugar, the insulin cannot react uh, properly. And basically, pathophysiologically, all CF individuals who have an exocrine pancreas insufficiency, they will develop diabetes at some time, uh, some time point. So you have to know this and you have to think about this. And it's important also to think early about it. And uh, this has been shown already 20 years ago uh, in this study. Here you had uh, children who had normal oral glucose, uh, oral, oral glucose tolerance testing. Um, they had normal um, HB1A1C, uh, so as a long time marker of glucose. Um, but if they had a long time monitoring, they had some abnormal glucose values. And when they, these patients, like in the pre diabetic phase, were given insulin, they had a markedly better lung function um, measured here by two different values. So, and it's an important message. So, even in this pre diabetic phase, um, the patients might profit from insulin, especially if they have lung function starting to decline. And that's why we need to think differently than we used to think. Uh, when I started uh, CF, we were told, you know, don't bother with, uh, with diabetes and that, the, that these adolescents have already so many treatments. Um, don't give them uh, syringe uh, things to, to inject, injections of insulin. This hurts and there's a lot of burden of treatment. Um, but nowadays you have to think of, no, no, you have to start early with this treatment. And to monitor um, uh, the, the problems of sugar, besides the glucose tolerance testings or the HbA1c, which are not uh, very sensitive, uh, it's good to do uh, this continu continuous glucose monitoring, um, uh, like with these systems here, where you have the little uh, thing that are is plotted or now you have even smaller like just a knob that you really can put on your arm for a few days where you have a monitoring of your blood sugar continuously over several days and then you really can say what is the glycemic uh, situation of the patient and start insulin very early uh, if you need to start it. CF bone disease is also a problem, more in advanced uh, disease. You see here the risk factors, lack of exercise important. So exercise like soccer, uh, contact sports is good for CF patient. Um, uh, this weight bearing, uh, bearing exercise, you, you, you have to give uh, enough uh, uh, vitamins, not only vitamin D, but also vitamin K and uh, uh, to monitor also if osteopenia um, starts and you do this the best with uh, this very, very low radiation uh, x-rays and if you have to treat it with bisphosphonates. Sinus disease is a very, very frequent uh, problem in your CF patients. They almost all have chronic renal sinusitis and uh, polyposis. So here, the treatment is like in the lung where you have just to take out the secretions. And this will be already like physiotherapy and inhalation, a very, very good uh, thing to do. Uh, you do this with saline irrigations. Nasal douching, like here my colleagues shows, where you have uh, a douche with uh, nasal saline, a normal saline, uh, you put it on one side of the nose and it comes out on the other side. So really, really make a douche. You, you take all these secretions uh, out of your nose and that's the best preventative treatment uh, for your sinus disease. 
Uh, Pseudobarter syndrome, you have to think about this, especially in infants. Um, it's a depletion of chloride um, and also of sodium, and then a secondary effect of potassium uh, because you lose the salt in your sweat. And important to know, um, uh, it leads to failure to drive if it's not just full-blown manifest, but uh, kind of slowly uh, repairing. So some countries give preventatively um, sodium chloride every day in the first year of life. We do, like, we do so. Um, sometimes problems that the, the children don't drink the milk very, the infants don't drink the milk very well because um, of the salt. So I have to, uh, to find alternative ways. Uh, but especially in the summer months, it's important to do it. And also in the older children to give uh, the children when they have, when they do sports, when they're outside, to give them isotonic fluids. If you have uh, full-blown pictures, then of course um, you have to substitute the sodium and the potassium, potassium usually with IV solutions. Other CF-related problems are arthropathy that can come, um, uh, this hypertrophic osteoarthropathy that will uh, manifest as a tenderness and pain over the long bones. 99% of the men are um, have an obstructive azoospermia, so they are main, uh, primarily sterile, but they still can have children if you do this maneuver that you take the sperms because the sperms are normal. The problem is that they cannot get out through the uh, vas afferents. Think of stress incontinence, especially in the more um, advanced uh, disease things because the, children, the adults uh, or young adults might cough a lot and lose um, uh, urine. And then very importantly, also with all the psychosocial problems. So it's not just uh, pulmonary physicians that will care um, uh, about uh, CF patients. It's a whole team um, of people who play a very important role. I told you how to monitor the lung disease, so, um, but you need to monitor the whole patient with the other things. So every three months, at least, uh, look at the growth parameter to do the lung functions and to culture the respiratory secretions and annually do all these things for looking for other complications of cystic fibrosis. So I conclude here. Um, so we know there are many, many complications and, and our adults colleagues see all these complications and uh, we have tried to prevent uh, these complications of occurring, I think especially the cardiovascular complications by giving two fatty uh, meals to our patients. Um, we think we need to think early about the CF related diabetes and uh, we need to involve our whole team. So we have time for one or two questions. Um, I start the first one. A nine months old boy with CF and pancreas insufficiency uh, does not gain adequate weight, although the parents say that he, they have given him enough uh, enzymes, which is probably not a cause of the problem. So the duodenal pH, which is too high. So you have an alkalytic uh, duodenal pH or the enzymes are taken at the wrong time, or you have celiac disease in addition to CF, or sodium depletion, or you have a milk protein intolerance in addition to CF. So this is correct. I try to emphasize it also in my talk, why this is a problem with the coated um, pancreatic enzymes, the acid resistance uh, capsules that you take. Good. The second question, a 16 year old boy with CF is diagnosed with multilobar biliary cirrhosis. Which of the following should not be done to start the treatment with ursodeoxycholic acid? to immunize the boy for hepatitis A and B, to start treatment with azithromycin, to start treatment with ibuprofen, or to treat with beta blockers in case of esophageal viruses.
this is correct, you should certainly not start the treatment with ibuprofen, especially because there you will have these high doses of ibuprofen that are used. And so you risk to have a bleeding in because the child might have portal hypertension. And then because of this in his um, spleen, he will destroy the thrombocytes and have also a risk of uh, bleeding. Azithromycin, you might start, but you might with azithromycin have to control uh, your liver uh, enzymes. And the third question, which of these treatments relate in CF-related diabetes is correct? Impaired glucose tolerance occurs in more than 20% of children before the age of 10 years of age. CF-related diabetes is mainly related to peripheral insulin resistance. Normal oral, oral Glucose tolerance testing excludes insulo, insulinopenia. Oral hypoglycemic agents are the first line of treatment. Or insulin treatment should be delayed in order to reduce the burden of treatment in adolescents. And yes, this is also correct. Um, very happy that uh, most of you have uh, answered correctly and certainly not the last one to delay um, the insulin treatment. Uh, start early your treatment. Oh, and I have a last question. Which of these statements is correct? DEXA is used to screen for bone fractures in CF patients. Polypectomy is the treatment of choice for nasal polyposis. Pseudobarter syndrome in CF is characterized by hyperkalemic, hypochloramic metabolic alkalosis. Hypertrophic osteoarthropathy in CF manifests as tenderness and pain over long bones. And obstructive azospermia affects mainly male patients with type 1 to 3 mutations. This is also correct for the majority of you. Um, this one, uh, the last one, a lot of people have said um, it affects mainly male patients with type um, uh, it, and, uh, sorry, the last one is it affects all CF patients and not only those with um, uh, the type uh, one to three mutations. And the pseudobarter syndrome is hypokalemic, hypochloramic metabolic alkalosis. Okay, so I hope you're not as exhausted as I am, and uh, I'm happy to take one or two questions. Okay, um, so we have uh, some questions. Um, do you give uh, vitaminic A, D, E, K supplementation in, sufficient, in pancreatic sufficient patients? Um, basically, you don't have to because they are pancreatic sufficient, uh, but we monitor it. And um, for a reason that I don't really always understand, some of these patients will have especially a lack of vitamin D, and then you will substitute the, the vitamins if they have a, a lack of the vitamins, but not prophylactically. Uh, when do you start uh, pancreatic enzymes? Uh... I don't know what the participant mean, but he wrote in CF type two, uh, do we need to give early in life despite no symptoms? I think as soon as they are non-sufficient, you should start. Yes, you have answered this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, took, took role of inhaled steroids in CF polyposis. So not inhaled, but topical steroids, you yeah. probably the patient, uh, the, the participant means. Uh, yes, it's, it's, the, it's a little bit controversial to, to what we say for the lungs, where we know that inhaled steroids uh, don't work for CF lung disease, but that's the treatment that uh, most people will give. And it has some effect, uh, but uh, in my also clinical experience, it's really the, the douching, 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 and douching of yeah. your nose. That's the main treatment. Um, mm -hmm. 
what uh, monitoring for bone disease uh, should you do once you start on bifosphonate? Well, you will repeat your DEXA measurements. Um, that's certainly what you will do. What do you, okay, what do you think about giving urso desoxycholic acid protective without hepatic cirrhosis? Um, we do it. We give um, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this medication to all children who have uh, liver involvement, so elevated liver enzymes and also findings on the ultrasound. But the evidence really that it helps uh, is, is quite is not so big, but we see that under the treatment, the liver enzyme normalize. The question is also how long do you have to give it? Sometimes after a few years, we stop it again, but uh, we give it, yes. Okay, uh, what is the place of surgery in uh, nasal polyposis? It, there is a place, of course. Um, if you have uh, failed on your conventional treatment with the na nasal irrigation and the topical steroids, then you will do a, a, tre uh, uh, a surgery. But when you do a surgery, don't do just a polypectomy, but do, do a radical surgery where you really open also the foramina so that, that then you have kind of a definite um, uh, solution to the problem. Okay, so I think we'll have the break. Uh, we have nine minutes break and then uh, we'll move on to the case-based uh, discussion on uh, cystic fibrosis.